Dawkins' complexity argument, it seems to be fundamentally a circular argument. You cannot be serious. How can you possibly say that such an entity is a single, simple entity? Is the issue fundamentally, Richard, that, that you'll, you'll never be satisfied with a, an immaterial explanation? There was a moment where I wanted to give Dawkins a standing ovation. I suppose. Unapologetic, from Premier Unbelievable. Peter, let's return to Dawkins' argument from complexity because that was really a significant marker on your journey, getting disillusioned with the new atheists. And it was something that came up time and time again, wasn't it, for you? Yeah. Well, you see, I realised quite early on, even before challenging Dawkins, um, you know, to his face, that this looked like a really bad argument. But yeah, he, he wheels this argument out you know, in all sorts of media situations, and it's the big argument that he makes. Um, but um, but no, it, it became very clear that this was very weak. And of course, when it came to um, the 25th of October, 2011, Dawkins did not show up um, to debate William Lane Craig. And William Lane Craig um, explained why that argument doesn't work and why all the other objections don't work. What was really what's really fascinating, though, is that watching Dawkins since then, since 2011, um, since his refusal to debate William Lane Craig, um, it's it's been fascinating to watch what's been happening with him and getting even more insight in this. I mean, I, I do get the impression that his refusal to debate William Lane Craig really has backfired on Dawkins. I mean, at, at the time as well, I should have mentioned that. Um, he was being criticised by atheists as well um, for not engaging. Um, the um, uh, the atheist philosopher who uh, who was at Oxford at the time, Dr. Daniel Kame, had written Dawkins a letter saying, um, you know, not debating William Lane Craig is a big omission on your CV and it could be interpreted as cowardice. So this was strong stuff. But Dawkins was just pushing back against this. Now, it's really interesting looking at Dawkins now because... There are some ways in which there might be some glimmers of hope in which he might have changed a bit, but there are other ways in which he is still firmly um, holding to exactly the same argument as if nothing had happened. Now, I think the first thing that's really interesting to consider um, would be 2012, early 2012. Um, so this is after all of the fallout from uh, Dawkins not debating Craig um, at the Sheldonian Theatre in 2011. Um, there was a moment during a dialogue with um, the Archbishop of Canterbury, Rowan Williams. It was chaired by the agnostic philosopher, Sir Anthony Kenny. And Kenny was sort of wanting to introduce a new point in the conversation. And he brought up Dawkins' central argument, that argument about God needing to be complex. And he illustrated a point there which, you know, William Lane Craig had already illustrated this. He'd already explained how Dawkins is getting confused between um, the the thoughts that God is capable of having um, or the, the effects that God is capable of creating and the actual complexity of God's composition. But this was a really interesting clip, um, which I'll, I'll play it now. This is, so this is 2012. Um, and... Anthony Kenny makes a really interesting um, little analogy to try and make this point, uh, raising this question about Dawkins' argument. And it's interesting to watch how Dawkins uh, responds to this. If we're asking God to be capable of designing the laws of physics, mm -hmm. min minimally designing the laws of physics, let's say, um, s setting the, twiddling the knobs to get the, mm -hmm. the universe's fundamental constants right, in order to produce a universe, perhaps um, dealing with the, um, the chemical events of the origin of life. Um, so he's got to be at least as compli complicated enough to do that, and he's got to forgive your sins and listen to your prayers and, and, or, and all that kind of thing. Don't, don't we have it's to... not a simple creature. Don't we have, well, don't we have to yes. distinguish between uh, two senses of complexity yes. uh, and of simplicity? Mm -hmm. uh, there is complexity of structure and complexity of function. Now, uh, traditionally, theologians have said that God was simple. That is to say, he had no structure. He was not spread out in space and time. 
But of course, in saying that he was omnipotent, they said that he had an enormous number of powers, an infinite number of powers. But there is a distinction between complexity of structure and complexity of function. Uh, take my electric razor. Uh, it is a much more complicated machine than a cutthroat razor. Uh, it, the cutthroat razor is simple in structure, but it has more complex powers than the electric razor because the electric razor can only be used to shave a beard, whereas the cutthroat razor could be used to cut a throat. <laughs> Indeed, you needn't even have a cutthroat razor. You just find a stone, a flint, and... and, and um, I, I really don't see what you're, what you're saying. I mean, you cannot... You cannot just be serious. Just from two senses of simplicity. Can, can, I, can I have a go? Yes, yes please, please, yes. <laughs> yes, you three are, you can do better. Not, not that I know much about razors. <laughs> 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 Don't you just that was great, wasn't it? Don't you just love that that mic drop moment from uh, Rowan Williams? That's hilarious. That was, and it broke the tension wonderfully as well. That was a great moment and when he did that. Um but so that's a really that was a I just thought that was a really effective illustration. And it shows again, Dawkins is assuming um that because God is capable of doing really complex things or really powerful things, that therefore um, God has to be composed uh, of a complex structure. And so, you know, that, that illustration of, you know, one, you know, the, the simpler um, object in structure can actually do more than the complicated, um, complex um, structure. So th that was a good illustration of how Dawkins is getting confused between these two categories. But you'll notice there, Dawkins' reaction was essentially just to get incredulous and just say, you know, you you know, is it sounding almost like John McEnroe? Kind of, you cannot be serious. Um, and he didn't really have anything to, to say about that. He just found the idea uh, of a really powerful God not having a complex structure to just be off the radar. He, it's as if he couldn't compute it. Um, now, and unfortunately, he, Dawkins went on to make some rather negative comments about Anthony Kenny as well. Um, in his forum at RichardDawkins.net, he said that. Um, you know, Anthony Kenny was just being a, a meddling chairman who was um, obscuring the conversation. Um, he, he, in, in another context, um, uh, do, in, in his touring with Lawrence Krauss, he said that um, Kenny had ruined the dialogue. And so this just seemed like a really sensitive issue for Dawkins. Now, but bear in mind, this is 2012. Yeah, so because this is this is what I wanted to ask you about because that's 2012, yeah. and you know, in some it's six years after the God delusion, but we're still slightly in the height of the new atheism, in the wave of the new atheism. But but Dawkins hasn't really shifted much on this position, has he? Because in some ways, I'd love to hear your response to a recent interaction that you had with Richard Swinburne, which we played on an unbelievable episode back in August, be because in some ways he's just sort of saying exactly the same things, but you know, beyond 10 years after those those conversations. Yes, that's right. Well, I mean, the, the, aston the what's, what Dawkins was basically, what Dawkins does is he gives an example of what Kenny calls complexity of function. So he'll say, you know, how can God be capable of designing the fundamental constants or how can he answer everyone's prayers? And then he will say that God cannot be simple. So he starts with an example of something... Um, powerful that God can do, and then basically just says he can't be simple. Um, he doesn't do anything to justify why God would have to have a complex structure, which is improbable, and that's what he needs. And the interesting thing is, if you look at, and that my recommendation, of course, is I'm, you know, I'm going to show some clips of Dawkins doing this, but of course, the best thing to do is to go and watch the full event, which we've got on the, our YouTube channel anyway. So it's definitely worth doing that, watching the whole thing. But it's interesting to watch here. Um, the, this is basically, these are the, all of the moments um, where Dawkins basically pushes back against Richard Swinburne, because Richard Swinburne, um, Christian philosopher from Oxford, he's got a whole, um, you know, argument about why God is a simple explanation for the universe. And it includes things like, you know, God is simple because he's not material. Um, he's only one entity that has really great explanatory scope and all sorts of criteria. And if you watch Dawkins um, 
in this little compilation, the question to ask is, whenever Dawkins talks about complexity and simplicity, is Dawkins referring to complexity of function or complexity of structure? So here we go. This is the little compilation that I've got here of um, all these moments where Dawkins is trying to object during that um, uh, dialogue with Swinburne. If you are saying that, that you need a god to explain why all these electrons and protons are behaving the same way, a god capable of doing that would have to be supremely complicated, and yet you're saying that but he's why? supremely simple. Why do you think he's got to be exceedingly complicated? <clears throat> because he's got to hold all these electrons in his little hands. No, How can he no, possibly he's not be simple? that sort of god at all. He has no extension in space. Okay, I think that's obviously um, a trivial point. What is it about this explanation that you're not happy to entertain, Richard, is it? Don't this, you know? Is it, is it simplicity? <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it obvious? <laughs> is, it sim is it simplicity, the main point, though? Or is it just something non-physical? Richard Swinburne is saying that God is simple because he's a single entity. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. How can he be a single entity if he's simultaneously controlling the universe, every particle in the universe, he's forgiving our sins, mm. he's giving us free will, he's deciding whether or not you'll die or not at a, on a certain day. Such a thing is not a single, simple entity. It's a highly complicated, mammoth, great, big, fat entity. <laughs> well, take another example of a very simple entity. Uh, uh, a particle <coughs> of matter here. This particle of matter is influencing all sorts of other particles of matter all over the universe. How can it do that with just being one particle of matter? Well, it does, according to uh, uh, the law of gravity. Well, yes, so what? I mean, that. Well, you were saying that in order to have <laughs> a large number of effects, it had to be a big thing. Mm. In order to do the things that God is supposed to be doing, he cannot be simple. He, he's an entity of subjective consciousness. He thinks about things. He has will, free will. He has the power to influence anything in the world that he wants to do. He even does the things that the Christians believe and all the other religions believe. How can you possibly say that such an entity is a single, simple entity? Do you think God can read our thoughts? Can you read the thoughts of everybody in this room? Yes. All Eight billion people in the world? Yes. And he's simple. He's reading all these thoughts and he's simple. He's not a simple entity. He's reading eight billion people's thoughts simultaneously. But that's but not the issue at play. It the is issue the is issue. People. We want a simple explanation. And I'm saying God cannot possibly be a simple explanation. He's a very complex explanation. Well, I think you get the, I think you get the gist, don't you? That's quite an onslaught. Um, and, and again... Um, you know, that, those are those are those moments that I've picked out to um, demonstrate the point. But again, go watch the full event because it's a good one to watch anyway. And you get to see more of the exchange. But notice what Dawkins was doing there. I think at least five times he repeats that same pattern of, again, Dawkins needs to establish that God is highly improbable, so improbable that it he's useless as an explanation. He's the worst possible explanation Nobody should believe in God because it's a ridiculous explanation for the universe. Too improbable. That's what Dawkins needs to establish for his argument to work. In order to establish that, he needs to argue um, He needs to argue that God is complex in the sense that God is made of um, parts that can be assembled and that is improbable and so forth. But every single time there, Dawkins repeats this pattern of... Um, giving an example of something really impressive or powerful or complex that God can do, and then he just gets incredulous, saying, you, you know, how could God possibly be simple if he's supposed to do these really big, powerful things? And he just keeps going round and round and round and round. And you, I think um, if you'll have noticed as well, at one point he even says, and this gives a bit more insight to sort of confirm it, he even says, how can God possibly be a single simple entity which seems to hint even more that god um that dawkins seems to be conceiving of um god as needing to be made of uh, matter like like if god um is a mind it would have to be attached to a brain with loads of neural networks and all sorts of stuff like that um so the thing that's actually 
that I came to realise, and this just sheds more light on it, is that Dawkins' complexity argument, it seems to be fundamentally a circular argument. Um, because he's basing the entire definition of God and the entire approach to the argument on assuming that materialism is true, namely that there is nothing um, beyond the natural material world. Um, and so it's a bit like, I mean, there's there's a caricature of Christian belief that is sometimes used as an example of circular reasoning. Um, and it is a caricature, though I have actually heard a Christian say this once when Dawkins interviewed him, which is... Yeah, which is not very inspiring. Um, but so I don't know if you've heard sometimes, um, you know, the art, the sort of caricature argument to represent circular reasoning will be made um, that um, the Bible is the word of God. I know that because it's written in the Bible. And I can trust that because the Bible's the word of God, because it's written in the Bible, because the Bible's the word of God. And, and you go round and round in circles and you look at it and think, oh, come on, that, can't you see what's wrong with that? Well, fundamentally, Dawkins seems to be doing the same kind of thing with um, his approach to this argument, um, because it essentially seems to be um, that something like this, there cannot be a supernatural designer of the universe, because any designer of the universe would have to be more complex and thereby more improbable than the universe, because there cannot be a supernatural designer of the universe. Namely, um, Dawkins has ruled out unembodied minds or spirits or consciousness um he has ruled out the supernatural options and what he's calling god is actually a great big gigantic natural physical creature he's limited himself to the material universe um so the interesting thing about this is that dawkins could have put forward a really interesting argument against the existence of god um and, you know, there are probably much more um, sort of um, rigorous atheist philosophers out there who are doing things like this right now. If Dawkins had made an argument like this, let's say, he could have done something like um, minds cannot exist without bodies. God is a mind without a body. Therefore, God cannot exist. Now, if somebody could defend, you know, an argument like that, that would be a really challenging, interesting argument, you know, that the, the people who believe in God would have to grapple with. But Dawkins doesn't even try. He just assumes um, that it appears to be, he just seems to be assuming that, you know, if God is an intelligence, it has to come attached to a body and physical properties and, and all those sort of things. Um, so, yeah, it's, um, it's fundamentally a circular assumption i think that's going on underneath that argument well i think that's thank you so much for pointing one of that out i think it's so interesting isn't it that almost 20 years after he sort of first started to make those arguments he's still very much sticking to his guns on this and not shifting his perspective at all um uh, but there are definitely moments that we've seen richard dawkins perhaps begin to not backtrack but perhaps show a little bit more nuance or a little bit more openness into some of the things. That, and again, this was something that appeared on The Unbelievable Show in a big conversation between Richard Dawkins and Francis Collins. And he just seemed a little bit more open, perhaps, to some of those things. And even his attitude in those conversations felt a little bit less combative, didn't it? That was really interesting. I mean, so yeah, so that example from the mystery of existence um, debate, I mean, that was very recent. Um, I mean, that that that, that was, um, you know, after the book had been printed. So I mean, there's no way of mentioning it in the book. Um, uh, but um, Dawkins' exchange with Francis Collins in 2022, so just the year before uh, what went on with Swinburne there, I can remember watching that and thinking, this is amazing. Um, and and I can only put it down to the good relationship that Dawkins has with Francis Collins. And I think it's a testimony to the fact that this isn't just about the intellectual side. It's not just about arguments. So you do need to be rigorous and make sure that they're good and that they're sound arguments. But it really is important relationally how you're getting on with the other person and how you're listening and how you're interacting. Um, because... There was a moment in Dawkins' interaction with Francis Collins where I wanted to give Dawkins a standing ovation, <laughs> um, really. Um, so, well, how about this? If, if I play it, yeah. maybe let, let's just see if we, can, if we can spot what it is. 
is the issue fundamentally, Richard, that that you'll you'll never be satisfied with a an immaterial explanation. You'll always be, as a scientist, in a sense, um, and as a materialist. Let's face it, it, it you, you're you're not going to sa- be satisfied with anything but a, a material explanation for the material universe we live in. Because that's part of it, I, I suppose. Um, perhaps we both come at it from a, with a, with with a bit of um, emotional. Not an emotional is the wrong word. A bit, a bit of presupposition. Um, as a, as somebody who's deeply steeped in evolution, um, I am kind of in love with the idea that it's possible to explain complex things in terms of simple things, and um, hmm. that's um, foreign to. It's normal human nature. It's a difficult thing for humans to grasp. And, and Darwin's great gift to us, I think, is to show that big complex things come into can come into existence by an explicable, understandable, beautiful, elegant process of gradual evolutionary change. And that's such a beautiful idea that... Uh, inventing a big complex thing, which God must be, if he exists, throws a ruddy great spanner in the whole works of the beauty of that Darwinian <laughs> concept of... You, you, you don't like the way the universe looks with, with this sort of... We're both really talking about how we like the universe to look, and, and I, I, I think it's yeah, probably... Yeah. But I, I suppose, Francis... Is is God this, you know, complex sort of mysterious explanation as far as you're concerned for the yes. universe? Yes, I mean, God, God, God's got to be co- co- complex. Um, I mean, I, I have come across the- theologians who say the beauty, the beauty of God, I think uh, Swinburne, uh, um, Rich, Richard Swinburne, the- theologian, says God is totally simple. That's the beauty of it. You don't need a complex God. He is simple. And... I mean, that's ridiculous because if he's simple, he couldn't invent the fundamental constants and the laws of physics. And, and... well, let, let's Fra- Francis, what's your view on oh, that? Oh no, I think whatever ability uh, we humans have to try to imagine what God is really like, if God exists, and I believe He does, uh, is got to be so completely pathetic <laughs> compared to the reality of that complexity. Uh, and that um, awesome uh, capability as a physicist, mathematician, a mind. I think of God as a mind, not as some, you know, gray-haired guy in the sky, which has been an unfortunate image foisted on generations of believers. Uh, I don't think God has gender. I think God is a mind that is capable of things that you and I cannot possibly imagine. If he exists, then that must be what he is. Yep. Yes, if if God exists. Now... You almost sound, Richard, that you would be disappointed ultimately if if that was the explanation. You would prefer that there be a sort of Darwinian explanation of the the universe itself. That that's sort of where your mind goes. You don't like the idea that there's actually is some kind of a mind behind. Yeah, it. that's a fair summary of what I just said. So there you go. I mean, well, I, I'd be interested to know from from you, Ruth. Actually, what was there anything in particular that struck you about what? You know, either what that conversation was like or, or what Doug and several. I'd just be interested to get your view before I jump in with what I, I mean, think. It's, to be honest, I, I had a similar reaction to you when I listened to it for the first time, watched it for the first time. I think I was so struck. I guess I'm so used to, obviously, Richard Dawkins is incredibly smart and I have so much respect for him as a scientist. But, you know, when I, I remember reading The God Delusion years and years ago when it first came out um, when I was studying university. At studying at university and ju- just being so struck by the tone of it and the kind of aggressive um, rhetoric and, and having watched debates, you know, I was always kind of struck by, depending on who the debater was, the Christian was often slightly more gracious towards Dawkins. And and what I really loved about that debate was just how cordial they both were towards each other. And I think that's probably not, um, it's not coincidental in that actually Francis Collins did a, a a fair amount to kind of help Christopher Hitchens in in his final um, years of life. And I think, you know, Dawkins sort of gave him a huge amount of respect, rightly so, because of that. So I think there's all of that at play. But but yeah, that was the thing. The tone of Richard Dawkins there was what struck me the most. And it um, perhaps I've just not 
seen as much as uh, of Dawkins as I should have done. But but in my very limited understanding of Richard Dawkins, his tone there quite surprised me. I think. Yeah, I, 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 it was the same thing. It, it, they they he was. I just got the impression he was loving it. Um, and he still had lots of moments of disagreeing very strongly um, with Francis Collins. But the two of them, there was a great respect between them. Um, and I'm sure some of the background with um, Francis Collins, you know, trying to give medical, um, you know, sort of pioneering medical aid to Hitchens as well was important. And I think it's because of that, something about that relaxed atmosphere. And then, and then there's, of course, there's Justin being a magnificent host as well. But um what I heard Dawkins say, and my ears just pricked up, and I thought, no, he didn't just say that, did he? Was um, it's that moment where he actually said, "Well, maybe there's a emotional, maybe maybe that's the wrong word, presupposition," um, and basically just admitting that he has a sort of a presupposition um toward that kind of um uh materialistic Darwinistic model um of explaining things and that would just i just that was jaw-dropping because i i'm used to hearing christians bang on about the word presuppositions you know we're, uh, um christian apologists are always talking about challenge people's presuppositions there's a whole school of apologetics called presuppositional um apologetic but now Dawkins is just very just this moment of just you know reflection and just very open honesty going you know sort of well maybe i've got some presuppositions in this area maybe i'm inclined towards it and i don't like the idea of um of this kind of god you know and and then of course you know francis collins you know he he starts by talking about you know god is complex um but clearly more in the sense of god is just kind of awesome and ha- you know would have all kinds of amazing in-depth sort of thoughts and capabilities and and that kind of thing but then even Collins got round to saying, you know, well, God wouldn't be like a person who has, you know, gender and stuff. God would be a mind. And even then it was interesting. Dawkins seemed to be open at that moment, even to the idea that God might be a mind. Now, now I don't know whether Dawkins in that moment was still picturing a mind as being necessarily tied down to neural networks or something and, and complex in that way. Um, or whether Dawkins is still conflating the the thoughts of a mind with the mind itself, like William Lane Craig has criticised. Um, but I but that just made me think maybe there's a little glimmer of hope here. Now, clearly, the following year, this year, when he was actually interacting with Swinburne, it didn't go quite so well, and and unfortunately, he reverted back to the old um, the old sort of equivocating and the, and all of those problems. Um, but it just seems to me, I would be fascinated to know, and I'd love to ask Richard Dawkins that, you know, if, and for him, it's probably a really big if, it would probably be crazy to consider this, but, you know, if it could be shown to him that God was ultimately simple in the sense that God is immaterial and doesn't have to evolve into parts, I mean, how elegant would that be? Because Dawkins could have all of that elegant, um, evolutionary creaturely development you know climbing mount improbable and the universe unfolding and all of these creatures and all of these attributes of the universe growing and and coming into existence and it could all be you know evolving and all that stuff could be happening from the point of ultimate simplicity just like Dawkins is asking for and what could be more elegant than a divine mind at the very base of the slope of mount improbable because that is the, like Swinburne and William Lane Craig say, that is the ultimate simplicity, a pure um, a pure mind who invents the material ro- world and then off you go, the whole thing can start. Um, but that's the big hang up. Dawkins is fixated on God can't be at the shallow end of Mount Improbable. He would have to be the great big complex improbable thing, uh, you know, at the at the sheer, the sheer cliff face. Um which is why, you know, the, um, well, two commentators um, that I also read and that I include in the book as well, um, I think they're, they're Catholics, um, Scott Hahn and Benjamin Weicker. The way that they sum it up is basically that at best, Dawkins has shown that a highly magnified Richard Dawkins could not have been the cause of the universe. <laughs> of that, we are already well aware. So I just get the sense for Dawkins, the challenge 
is fundamentally questioning his materialist presuppositions. Now, I don't know how and when that's going to happen, but, you know, little moments like that with Francis Collins, that gives me a bit of hope. Um, it's, it's, it's interesting just to, we're just going to have to watch and see what happens next. Yeah, yeah. Well, speaking of what happens next, just as we come to the end of this, Peter, what, do you have any idea... In some in some ways, we're seeing, and I think particularly, you know, through this book, coming to faith through through um, Dawkins, we're seeing a kind of waning of new atheism. But do you have any idea what the new new atheism will be? W- what is it that's gonna, in some ways, be next? Well, you know, where where are we gonna see, not just the country but the world go in terms of these sort of religious discussions and and atheistic discussions? Do you think? Oh, it's such a good question, isn't it? I mean, I, yeah, I, I do think that, I think um, as far as the new atheism of Dawkins and Hitchens and Harris and Dennett is concerned, I'm tempted to say, for what it's worth, that it's probably still making some ripples, but they ran out of stones. I th- I think that's what's happened. I, I do think the new atheist movement has exhausted itself and, and all sorts of commentators have... Um, you know, sort of explained why better than I. And Alistair McGrath did a good job of that as well. But I think the thing that I'm a bit sad about, but again, this is only from my limited perspective in in my walk of life. There might be other people for whom it's very different. I got the sense that when I was at university and all this was kicking off, it was a great time where you could dig into these issues from the top down. You could basically cut right to the chase and go for a big debate about does God exist? Is there a purpose to the universe? Yes or no, maybe, what is it, whatever. And get people arguing, partly because of Dawkins. This is where I need to say thank you, Dawkins. You helped You helped make that happen. And people got talking about it more. Those bus adverts contributed to it. Um, there was a real um, rigour of people being able to dive straight in and have, you know, God conversations. Now, however... I don't get the sense that that kind of, that that's happening. Um, I get the sense that it's not about going straight for the question of, does God exist? You know, did Jesus rise again? You know, is there a purpose? I get the sense that it's more about going from the bottom up rather than the top down. I get the sense that people at the moment are just generally overwhelmed, struggling to get through their day, and are almost looking for pragmatic approaches um, which might be why people like, you know, I'm not the first person to say this, and there are probably people hearing this going, oh, I'm sick of hearing this. Uh, but it might be why people like Jordan Peterson have taken off, because um, even though, yeah, he is not a, he is not an outright, you know, um, what you would call a Christian, um, you know, he is, you know, he is definitely kind of, you know, playing around with the spiritual realm and, and, and the Bible and, and Christian worldview ideas, but he's going from the bottom up. He's going from, um, you know, stand up straight, make your bed and trying to help people get their life back in order uh, and more bearable. Um, And then again, you've got all of the you've got all of the what people, you know, some people call, you know, the the culture wars and woke and all that kind of stuff. Um, And people are getting really worked up over identity issues and political issues. These are all things that are at a lower existential horizon than the really big questions about does God exist? You know, is does anything happen after death? We've got so wound up about what's happening in the here and now. And, you know, for big things that do affect people, these aren't trivial things. But we're so wound up about that that it's it's harder to have the big direct theism, atheism questions. And on the subject of things changing, it was really interesting as well. You know, we've been speculating about will Dawkins soften up a bit to be more open about uh, reevaluating his arguments. But I was watching an, um, a discussion he um, uh, he had recently with Peter Bogosian, where he actually said there might be some circumstances where it's better for people to stay Christians than to try to persuade them into atheism because their Christian beliefs might be safeguarding them against something worse coming in to fill the void that's left when the Christian belief goes. I would never have... I mean, could you imagine him saying that in 2006 or even two, you know, 20, uh, 2011 or 2014? That is new, and, and that's interesting. So I think even Dawkins and these people are grappling with it's not just a straight case of, you know, knock religious belief out and then you get a rational scientific utopia. 
um, we've ended up with what he might even call a sort of postmodern nightmare, given that um, Dawkins is a modernist, I think it's fair to call him. So in terms of what will the new new atheism look like, I think the best of it is probably um, conversations with atheists and people of different views, which are more rigorous. Um, you know, there was like Thomas Nagel, for example, who I quoted back then. He's got a much more rigorous idea of what God is and the arguments. Um, I'm hoping that there will be better quality and more nuanced conversations with more respectful engagement, um, partly because we saw that the new atheist model, it's not a very good one. But equally, things are, are getting more harsh now with people arguing on social media and all that kind of stuff. So I just get the sense that... Um, in terms of a new, new atheism, I think atheism seems to be assumed more than arg even more than argued for. Um, so the question will be, will people start to see cracks in atheism and wonder maybe there's something else in it after all? Um, and that's, you know, what um, there's speculation about some of that in the book. And then there's Justin Briley's book, um, The Surprising Rebirth of Belief in God, that's looking into this stuff. And you had you've had the brilliant you've had a brilliant conversation with Alistair McGrath and um, Alex O'Connor on this as well. So in terms of where things are going, I'm not sure, but it looks like it's bottom up rather than top down. That's that's the best I can say. Great. Well, Peter, I you know, I've so enjoyed our conversation. We really would love to know what everyone else thinks about this stuff. Please do let us know because it's just no one, well, let's be honest, no one knows where this is going to go really. And in some senses, it is a kind of question of watch this space. But Peter, I've so appreciated our conversation today. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you, Ruth. It's been brilliant. Unapologetic from Premier Unbelievable. For more shows, resources and our newsletter, visit premierunbelievable.com.